Hi. What I have on the workbench today is a DS Logic U3 Pro 32 Logic Analyzer from Dream Source Lab. On this channel, I had reviewed a rather capable handheld oscilloscope from them not too long ago. So, of course, I wanted to check out what they have to offer with their best and most capable logic analyzer. And that's why we have it here today. And if you haven't watched my review video of the DS401012 oscilloscope, I'd encourage you to take a look, as its touch user interface implementation is excellent. Anyway, Dream Source Lab provided me this logic analyzer for review. As usual, I will provide a link in the video description below for those who are interested in getting one after watching this video. And by the way, you can purchase it directly from their website. The logic analyzer comes in this nice semi-rigid instrument case. If you watch my review video of the DS401012, you'll notice that the instrument case is exactly the same as the one used for the oscilloscope. Inside the instrument case, you have this tiny logic analyzer sitting in the middle. Of course, I just took it out, but when it was shipped, it was sitting in the middle like this. It is made of a brushed aluminum, and it just looks beautiful. In the zipper compartment, we also got two bags of these flying wire leads. Of course, I have taken them out, so that it's easier for me to show you. Each bundle has four channels, and we have six sets in each bag, so you've got plenty extras. I've taken one out earlier, so let's take a look. Just from a casual look, you can already see that these leads are very well made. Just look at the attention to detail here. On the header side, you can see we have this position key, and it even has a Dream Source Lab logo on it. Isn't that beautiful? That's the header that you plug into the logic analyzer. And on the other side, you can see we even have this indicator here that indicates one, two, three, four. Those are the different four channels here. And on this end, each channel has its own independent ground, as you can see here, and the channel wires are color-coded. Of course, for low-frequency digital circuitry, you can just use a single ground. But having a dedicated ground connection with each channel wire is essential if you are dealing with higher-frequency circuits. Look at that. You can even see a ground symbol on the ground wire here. Not sure if you can see. Let me just zoom in a little bit. That's a level of attention to detail here. So these are really high quality flying wire connectors. You also get two bags of these mini grabbers, 10 in each bag. Again, you have extras as we only have 32 channels. And if you take a look at the mini grabbers, I took one out earlier. These also feel like very high quality mini grabbers. You also get this thick USB-C cable and it's definitely very high quality for the high data rate that the device needs. And you can see that we even have the Dream Source Lab logo printed on the connector here. And finally, inside this little pouch, you have a QC sticker and some very basic instruction manual. So if you do any digital circuit development work, chances are you have used a logic analyzer before, or at least you have heard of it. Nowadays, a lot of the digital scopes, including Dream Source Lab's own DS401012 I reviewed a while back, all offer protocol decoding capability with the existing input channels. Certainly, a lot of hobbyists find it sufficient using an oscilloscope for doing logic analysis. I remember when I was doing reverse engineering of a toy helicopter's IR control about 10 years ago. The only tool I had at the time was a RIGO DS1052 two-channel oscilloscope. And I still managed to figure out the control signals by recording and compare the recorded signals. It was a painful exercise, but it could be done. The main limitation of using an oscilloscope to decode, as compared to using a logical analyzer, is that you are limited by the number of input channels. With a dual channel scope, you are pretty much limited to decoding UART, I2C, or one wire protocol. With four channels, you do have more flexibility. You can decode spy protocol and potentially decode more channels if you use, say, the clock signal and another signal as reference, and swapping in different signals with the remaining two oscilloscope channels. Of course, for this to work, the signal would have to be repetitive, as you cannot acquire everything all at once. For more serious work, though, you would definitely need a dedicated logic analyzer. For the longest time, I was using a cheap 8-channel generic logic analyzer, and it was rather rudimentary. You can capture signals, but you will have to do the analysis by yourself, since it did not have any triggering capability. It was very hard to capture infrequent signals. 
The software supplied with the DS Logic series can not only decode signals, but also trigger on specific patterns. As I mentioned earlier, the U3 Pro 32 is the top of my model. In the DS Logic series, DreamSource Lab has three models. They're all PC based. Besides the number of channels, the maximum sampling rate, and onboard buffer size, the main functionalities are pretty much identical among these three models. You can choose based on your need. For the majority of hobbyists, the DS Logic Plus would probably be sufficient. The U3 Pro 32 I have here has 32 input channels. It has a maximum sampling rate of 1 GHz and has 2 gigabits of onboard sampling memory. The generous amount of onboard sampling memory is what really sets this logic analyzer apart from many other PC-based logic analyzers. Most analyzers support only the so-called streaming mode, meaning data is streamed from the analyzer input to your connected computer via the USB cable. The actual data capturing happens on the computer itself. This means that the maximum data rate is limited by the USB transfer speed and other activities that's going on on the computer. The buffered mode on the DS Logic device allows you to capture the sample data onto the onboard DRAM and then the data is transferred from the DRAM to the computer. Because it's not limited by the USB transfer speed, the throughput is much higher using this method to capture data. Of course, the drawback is that the capacity of the onboard memory is limited. With 2 gig of memory on this U3 Pro 32, you can still capture quite a bit of data. Here you can see a chart showing the sampling rate versus the number of channels and the sampling method. You can see that in buffer mode, the logic analyzer can support the maximum 1 GHz sampling rate with 8 channels, whereas in streaming mode, you can only have 3 channels to get the maximum 1 GHz sampling rate, and that is assuming you are using a USB 3 connection versus USB 2. And if you are using USB 2, the maximum sampling rate in streaming mode would be significantly reduced. This time I'm going to shift things around. Before I show you the software and some real-world tests, let's actually open it up and take a look inside to understand how this logic analyzer works. Dimension-wise, this U3 Pro 32 is actually very tiny. It is only 79 millimeters in length, 74 millimeters in width, and 9 millimeters in height. So that's a really tiny device. And look at how beautiful the print is on the brushed aluminum surface here. So let's open it up. And by the look of it, we actually need to take four more screws out before we can remove the board. The board fits in very, very tightly and I had to give it a gentle pry to take it out. And you can see the case is just beautiful. It looks like it's a single piece of uh, machined aluminum here. On this side of the board, you can see we actually don't have a whole lot going on here. This chip here is a CYUSB 3014, which is a USB controller with an integrated 200 MHz ARM 926EJ core 32-bit CPU. This controller chip is actually not cheap. It is roughly $30 each in quantity. Obviously, this is used to manage the USB 3 communications, but I suspect the onboard CPU is also used to handle other tasks that are specific to this logic analyzer. Looking at the silk screen here, you can see that it appears this board has been revised quite a bit as the version here is 3.1.1. So it appears that the main circuitry is on the other side of the board. So let me flip it over and let's take a look. Yep, as expected, this side is where the magic happens. At the center of the board, no pun intended, we have this Spartan 6 FTG256 series FPGA. If you watch my teardown of the DreamSource Lab DS4T1012 oscilloscope, you will recognize this chip, as it is the same chip used in that oscilloscope. DreamSource Lab must have extensive expertise in developing on the Spartan 6 platform, so using it here makes a lot of sense, as the Spartan 6 definitely supports the design specs of this logic analyzer. Now, this FPGA is quite expensive. The quoted price is around $60 each in large quantities. Not sure you can see from this angle, but look at these length-matched traces. Aren't they beautiful? It never gets old looking at these traces. Now, board of this complexity definitely requires a multi-layer PCB. You can probably route the FPGA with a four-layer board, but my hunch is that this is at least a six-layer board. 
Near the input header, we have a row of these six-pin devices. I assume these are TVS clamping diodes for protecting the input. The manual suggests that this device can withstand plus minus 30 volts. In this corner, we have a ADF4360-7, which is an integrated synthesizer and VCO. Again, this is the same chip used in the DS401012 oscilloscope from DreamSource Lab. My guess is that the VCO is used to synthesize the clocks for different sampling rates. Next to the synthesizer, we have these two unpopulated JTAG headers. I would assume one is probably for the FPGA, the other one is for the USB 3 controller on the other side of the board. The 8-pin SOIC next to the JTAG header is a 25R2035F, which is a 2 megabits flash memory chip. On the other side of the Spartan FPGA, we have this D9PTK 2 gigabits DDR3 memory chip from Micron. And this is the onboard sample memory and is used when the buffer mode is turned on. This chip up here next to the DDR memory is a TPS51200 sync and source DDR termination regulator that provides the power to the DDR3 memory down here. And moving down, by the placement of these inductors, we can tell that this must be a bug converter. In fact, this one is actually a 26480AA bug converter from Texas Instruments. Interestingly though, the logo still shows National Semiconductor. This could be an old stock, but I highly doubt it given that National was acquired by TI back in 2011, so that was quite some time ago. Anyway, this buck converter has multiple output rails needed to power the FPGA. In the middle, right above the USB connector, we have this HD3220 USB-C DRP or dual row port controller chip. And to the right of the USB connector, you can see we also have an inductor, so this is definitely another DC-DC converter. And this chip is marked as 1201, and I think it's a TI-TPS561201, which is capable of outputting 1 amp of current. And that's pretty much all there is on the circuit board. I have to say though, the hardware design is really impressive. Now let me reassemble it, and we'll take a look using the DSView software and capture some signals. The software DreamSource Lab provided is called DSView, and it's based on the SIGROC project, and it's also open sourced. So in theory, you could add additional functionality to the program as you have access to the source code. I believe SIGROC actually supports some of the DSLogic logic analyzers, but just not the U3 Pro ones. Maybe it hasn't caught up yet. And by the way, the DSView software also works with their DScope series USB-based oscilloscopes. Anyway, obviously I won't be able to go through all the features here in this video. The software is fairly easy to navigate, and it has a ton of features. DSView runs on all major operating systems, including Linux, which is the OS I primarily use. As you know, my main computer is a Linux box. Now, my main computer is a server PC, and it does not have USB 3.0 port. So when I plug in the U3 Pro 32, I will get this warning message, reminding me that the maximum data rate using the streaming mode will be limited. And if you look at the device options, you will see that in stream mode, the fastest sampling rate using three channels is only at 100 MHz, and that is limited by the USB 2 transferring speed. But if we change it to buffer mode, you will see that the maximum sampling rate is now at 1 GHz for up to eight channels, which is independent of the USB transferring speed. So this is definitely a great feature with this logic analyzer. For today's demonstration though, I will use my Windows laptop as my desktop is on the other side of the lab. And this Windows laptop does have USB 3.0 port. And you can see that the maximum sampling rate increased to 1 GHz instead of the 100 MHz we had with USB 2. Now remember, in buffer mode, we can do 1 GHz sampling with 8 channels. And with USB 3, you can only achieve 250 MHz sampling rate with the same 8 channels. So the benefit of buffer mode is very clear, especially you need to acquire high-speed signals. If you poke around, you will see that the features this software offers is actually quite rich. It has a ton of decoders for you to decode pretty much everything you can think of. You can see that we have a lot of different types of decoders here. Now, 
Setting up the logic analyzer can take quite a bit of time, and it requires careful planning, especially if you need more than just a few channels. To debug any moderate to complex digital circuitry, you will need to have some kind of breakout boards or configure test points available, as most of the modern chips are surface mounted and have very dense pin pitch, which makes direct probing tricky at best, if not impossible. So in my demonstration, I'm going to show you just a couple of simple protocols. The first test I'm going to show you is using U3 Pro32 to capture some serial data, and the data is generated via an Arduino board with fairly low 9600 baud rate. The Arduino is outputting Hello World continuously. Once you connect to the device, it will show up here, and the light on the U3 Pro32 will turn green. And if the program did not recognize the device, this drop-down box will only have the demo device. Anyway, so now we're connected. So let's take a look at some settings. And as mentioned earlier, we're currently in stream mode, which means that the device would capture the data and transfer it to the PC in real time. Right now, you can see here we're using all 32 channels, and it really doesn't matter. We can just choose three, but given the UART data rate, it doesn't really matter. Let's click OK. And on the sample rate, we are currently setting at 5 MHz, and that's plenty for our 9600 volt rate. The acquisition time length is set to 1 second. Now we need to configure the protocol because this is a UART signal. Let's uh, search for UART. And we do have a couple of options. The other options allow you to set more parameters, but we're not going to go into the details here. So you can see here, we have the RXTX pin, and in this case is pin 0. And the baud rate, as we mentioned earlier, that's 9600, so we'll change that. Everything else we can leave as default here. So let's hit OK. And now we should be able to acquire the signal. And you can see we already have this UR channel enabled here at channel 0. All right, right now the channel is set up. In theory, we should be able to acquire the signal. So let's give it a go. And you can see we have captured something here. Of course, you can always zoom in here, but there is a better way to do it. You can see on the right pane here, we already captured the signal here. So if we click on one of the captured data points, it will zoom in and it will show you the captured data. So you can see that's indeed Hello World. So that's a decoded signal here. I realize we probably don't need all the 32 channels here, so let's just configure it and we'll get rid of some. So now let's say we just use, let's use six channels, that's plenty. And we want to display the max height to be three times. So we will see a little bit more on the screen here. So let's give it a try. And you can see this is the signal we're getting here. For the second test, let me show you an I2C protocol. And for that, I'm going to probe the communication between an Arduino and an SHT21 temperature and humidity sensor. And by the way, this was one of my earlier fun projects using servo motor to translate the digital output to an analog display, which is fun. Let me actually do a quick demo here. So here is the temperature and humidity sensor, as you can see. These are powered using two servo motors. And we're reading in the data from this sensor here, this tiny breakout board here. And I do have the headers. Later, I'll plug into the logic analyzer. Here's our Arduino board, here are two servos. So let's power it on, and let's see what we got here. And you can see that's the lab temperature here, and if I put my hand on the sensor here, you'll see that the temperature is rising and the humidity is changing. So that is kind of fun. But anyway, in today's experiment, we're going to just uh, take a look at the data coming out from the sensor. So let me hook that up with the computer. All right, so I just hooked it up with the logic analyzer, you can see here, through these flying wires. And the first thing we're going to set up is the protocol here. So we're going to get rid of that UART we just did. Now we're going to add a I2C decoding here. So we're going to do I2C. Again, there are different options. This one is the most basic one. So I think the clock is 0 and data is one. Now, if it's wrong, we will just swap it later. So let's take a look here. So that looks good. 
And we probably want to increase the frequency here to, let's say, 10 megahertz. It doesn't really matter as it's still pretty slow. So now let's give it a go. And did I do it correctly? By the look of it, let's see here. It looks like the clock is actually the second one. So let's swap it out. So let's come here. And so the clock is one. The data is zero. OK, so now let's hit OK. Yeah. So now you can see we are decoding the data here. So if we zoom it out, you can see. Let's give it another run. Actually, let's change it to two seconds. And run again. So if you zoom in here, you can see we get a lot of uh, packets here. If we click on any of these data elements on the right panel here, let's just see here, you will see that that is the decoded data element. Quite neat, huh? So this is an example of using the logic analyzer to decode an I2C signal. And of course, there is a lot you can do with the software. For example, you can measure the frequency of the clock here. And you can do some other measurements. I'm not going to go into the detail here, but you get the idea. Now, as mentioned earlier, we also have this triggering capability. And you can see it is quite comprehensive. You can set multi-stages. And each stage, you can specify a triggering condition and the relationship between the different stages, so on and so forth. I'm not going to go into details in this video. For the last test, I wanted to show you the buffer mode. Now, I don't have any high-speed signal circuitry to test at the moment, but let me simulate a clock signal using the function generator. So on this DG2070, I'm outputting a sine wave at 70 MHz, and the signal is shifted so that it remains positive during the entire cycle. As you can see here, I have it set to an amplitude of 2 volts peak to peak with an offset of 1 volt. So the signal is above zero. I could have used a square wave, but this function generator cannot output a square wave at that high frequency. So the only choice I have is the sinusoidal. Anyway, it doesn't really matter as the logic analyzer digitizes the input signal based on the threshold. So now let me set up the logic analyzer here. I'm going to get rid of the decoder here. And I'm going to come back here to set it to buffer mode. I have already set it. And here we're setting it to eight channels. So we have a maximum one gigahertz sampling rate. And there are a few more settings. You can see that I have also set the time scale to be two microseconds. And now let's give it a go. And bingo, you can see that we are able to capture that 70 megahertz clock signal with no problem. So that's the beauty of the buffer mode. If we wanted to get a good representation of the clock signal, the recommended sampling rate should be 10 times the frequency we're looking at. So we can definitely use the maximum 1 GHz sampling frequency. As you can see, the DS Logic U3 Pro 32 is really a solid logic analyzer, and you can use DSView to acquire and analyze different protocols and help you troubleshooting your designs. I only scratched the surface in this video. If you have any additional questions, please leave me a comment in the comment section below. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Your participation makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching, and I will catch up with you next time.